you can go on the internet, okay? You can click on the big blue E and go on the internet. You'll last about 21 seconds before you get a virus. <laughs> so you have to install the antivirus program first. Um, but uh, what else? Right, you can use this really great program called WordPad. And I think the other one is uh, Notepad as well. And that's basically it. There's not much you can do. You get just the operating system, you put it in, you load it up, and boom, that's it. Whereas if you take Mac OS X, we'll, we'll be nice to somebody else, um, and you put that in, you can usually do a few more things. It quite often comes with part of the iLive suite. You can do iTunes and, th and such things as that. But uh, if you take an average Linux CD, for example, an average Ubuntu distribution or something like that, or actually what I'm running on this machine right here, and you stick it in, and all of a sudden, before you even get started, OpenOffice is already installed, GIMP is already installed, several browsers are already installed, not just Firefox. Um, there are some programming tools that are already installed, and so forth. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. To install everything else, it's just simple. You go to the Ubuntu Software Center, you click, and what did I just, oh. Uh, you click on the Ubuntu Software Center, and it goes out to the internet and says, oh, okay, hey, you can install this and install this. It's a lot like uh, going to the app market in Android or on your iPhone. You know how on your iPhone when you want to put in an application, you go and you say, I want that one. And you click, and a few minutes later, it's on your phone. It's pretty much the same way with most Linux distributions as well. Except it's free. Except it's free, yes. <laughs> um, and open source. I guess that's the biggest thing that I want to point out, okay? There's free, and then there's freedom. Client access licenses, don't those things just drive you nuts? Not only do you just buy it, and a lot of students don't know this. We say, oh, we just install it on a whole bunch of machines. What you don't realize is that every one of those machines that connect to the network in one fashion or another, uh, depending on the operating system, may need a user access license in order to get on the network. Uh, and it may be a matter of it physically won't connect, or it may be a matter of you're breaking the rules. Okay? Most of us break the rules anyway, but uh, to talk about what's going on in the world today. What's going on in, in, in I'm sure it's going on down here as well. Uh, we've got pretty much a taxpayer revolt going on all over the country uh, with people just simply don't want to pay any more money for all of these things, in particular, education. You know, we're, we're getting attacked from, uh, uh, from above with, with regard to teacher pay and, and teachers' unions and so forth and so on. And not only that, uh, taxpayers are looking at it and said, no, you can't have $450,000 to buy computers this year. Okay, we're only going to give you $300,000. Now, that's a big chunk that's taken out. Um, and here are some ways that you as a school, you as a classroom, you as an individual teacher can save a little bit of money. And one of the biggest things that we neglect to do is remember who the customers are. As tech guys, again, I'm on both sides of the aisle here, as tech directors, quite often we look at, okay, we've got to keep the teachers happy. Okay, as long as the teachers ha are happy, I'll be fine. We don't worry too much about the kids. One of the customers that we have are our administrators, the principal, the vice principal, uh, superintendent, so forth and so on. Parents. Parents want to make sure that their kids are getting uh, what they need in order to compete in the world today. Teachers, the biggest bunch of whiny babies I've ever met. You change one little thing on their desktop and they're like, I can't find it. Where is it? Oh my God, it's gone! True story. True story. And this is going to come out on video and some of my uh, people at home are going to see this. But uh, this happened several years ago when the person that we did it to is no longer there. So I can say this. But um, the true story, we had recently switched over to Firefox. And I had a teacher that was just making a really big fuss over the fact that I don't want Firefox. I want to use Internet Explorer. Okay, I go to click on the big blue E, and it comes up, and it does what I want it to do. Some teachers are very resistant to change. So I told my tech, um, Bruce, who's a great guy, I said, go down to her room and change the icon for the big blue E and change, um, change, change the icon for Firefox to a big blue E. It's very easy to do in Windows. You just simply go into property, change the icon. And so we changed the Firefox icon to the big blue E and we never heard from her again. <laughs> for some people, it's all about the window dressing. 
In fact, at one point when I first deployed Linux to my school, I used a, uh, uh, a theme that looked very much like Windows XP. So for the most part, I just would walk, hey, did you check out that new version of Windows that we put on your computer? <laughs> yeah, it's awesome, I love it, the clip art is great. <laughs> it wasn't Windows. But the clip art was awesome. Another true story though, uh, in, in defense of my teacher to my school, I did have one teacher, uh, I walked down, she uh, was teaching first grade at the time, and I walked into her room and she said, can you get rid of that computer? And she was pointing to the Linux computer, uh, excuse me, the Windows computer that was in the room. She said, I don't want it, the other ones are so much better, and those were Linux thin client, and the clip art is so much better on these things. Well, who am I to argue? Uh, it, it, for me, if she thinks the clip art is better on the Linux machine, no problem. I took it out of there really quick, Setting up a Linux thin client takes about two minutes, just enough time to plug everything in. There's no loading of software or anything. And boom, she was up and running and very happy and, and life was good. The taxpayers want to make sure that they're getting what they paid for, okay? And they don't want to spend too much for some of these things that they're getting. But the customers are the students. And we quite often forget that. When we're buying computers and so forth, we buy for all these other people, but we forget who they're really for. We forget who the software is really for, okay? We're more concerned with making sure that the, uh, the central office has an office suite that they're comfortable with and that the secretaries have something that they're comfortable with, and we, we tend to forget the students. We can treat these other people as separate entities. I do. My, my own office at my school is off on their own, in their own little world with their Windows machines and their office suite, and the rest of us use uh, other things. He's in sixth grade now, too. <laughs> One of the great things about using open source is the ability to be able to give every student a technological edge. Um, you all have them. Uh, uh, my, my area, probably, I'm going to say, it changed over the years. If I were to ask this question uh, six or seven years ago, how many of you have internet at your house, uh, probably maybe half of the hands might have gone up. How many of you have a laptop at your house? Same thing. Nowadays, when I ask that question, probably 90% of them go up. But there's still that 10% that don't have anything. They either don't have the internet, or they don't have a computer, or they can't afford a computer, or maybe they've got a hand-me-down running Windows 98. Remember that? Okay. Uh, we have an opportunity, using open source software, to give every student a technological edge. We can hand them the software that they need that's the same as the software here at school, that's the same as the operating system here at school that they can use at home. Uh, another true story. Uh, for those of you familiar with uh, uh, Linux distribution, Ubuntu comes on a CD, and uh, you can actually stick it into a computer and it will load up in what's called a live version. In other words, it won't make any changes to your computer. You can actually play with it and so forth, and if you decide you like it, then you can click on install. If you don't like it, you just simply take it out of the CD drive and your computer is back to, it, to the way it was. I had a girl who uh, uh, their family had a relatively old computer. They were in the process of getting a new one. Um, and she needed to do a slideshow. Um, and they didn't have Microsoft Office, and she didn't really want to put OpenOffice on it uh, without her father's permission. So I said, here, take this CD home. Put it in your machine. Uh, you can open it up. You can do work on your slideshow, and then you can save it to a thumb drive or a floppy disk or whatever we were using at that time. And uh, then you take the CD out, and the computer's right back to normal. And uh, so that was a great way, first of all, to give her the software and the tools that she needed to be able to do her job. But I also said this. However, leave the CD in the drive until your dad gets home. And tell him, hey, dad, I formatted the computer and installed Linux. What do you think? <laughs> her father is second in command in the Maine State Police. Comes up to me at a soccer game one day and says, you drive to work, right? <laughs> uh, but seriously, after the conversation continued on a little bit, he said, you know, that was really cool. Because he, he had actually sat down and played with it a little while before, they, before his daughter, you know, uh, let him know that if you take the CD out, everything's fine. And, uh, but he said, are you sure that's free? Because it's got so much top on it. Yeah, it does, doesn't it? Isn't it pretty cool? And yes, I still drive to work, and he's never stopped me. <laughs> Actually, he's a detective, so he's not a patrol officer. But the biggest thing is that free and open source software levels the playing field. Now you can take the kid that has nothing, 
hand them a CD, a DVD, a thumb drive, whatever, they, or even a website for that matter, hand it to them, and they can have the same software that everyone else does. Particularly something like Open Office. Open Office is a perfect example. You know, a lot of kids, they get a hand-me-down computer. It doesn't come with Microsoft Office installed on it, and they need something. And they can get a full featured office suite simply by using something like Open Office or LibreOffice. The operating system in the software is so irrelevant. It really doesn't matter. Um, and a lot of people put a lot of emphasis in, it must be Microsoft Office. It must be, I work, what is it, 09, 010, 11? I don't even know what it's up to now. But uh, uh, it must be these different, uh, these different titles. No, it doesn't. The kids don't care. How many kids do you know walk into a cell phone store and say, I must have a phone that has such and such operating system, operating system revision number, blah, 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 so forth. And so. They don't care. Does it play music? Does it take pictures? Can I text people? That's all they want to know. So it's really irrelevant. The operating system is irrelevant. When I first introduced Linux Thin Clients or Linux Desktop to my classroom in 2001, the kids thought it was cool. Why? Because they could change their own wallpaper. You mean I could change the wallpaper and put whatever I want? Yeah. They thought it was great. I'll skip over a few of these things. How am I doing on time, Brian? Oh, okay. One of the big things uh, that I'll talk about with these last couple of slides very quickly is the fact that with today's kids, it used to be an issue uh, back in the older days when there was really only one thing to choose from, and uh, we had a group of kids who were not what we call digital natives. Okay, they had kind of come up through the system like we had, and they were being introduced to computers for the first time when they got into school and so forth. Now most kids are being born with an iPod in their hand. You know, today's children have never known, in fact, many of them have no idea what a CD is. They've never seen a CD. They've never known that you can actually walk into a store and buy a CD and then do something with it. Why would you do that? You just go to the iTunes store, you go to Amazon, or, or you download it illegally. <laughs> um, you guys have never done that, right? Uh, but the, the idea of, of, of open source software is it's very flexible. It allows you to choose what you feel uh, works best for you, what you feel works best for your school and your classroom. 